What I'm going to talk about is truly amazing. It sounds like something out of science fiction, and it's something that even most physicists probably know little about. I only found out about it myself recently while researching a book about nuclear physics. But it's relevant to everybody, and it definitely should be much more widely known. Everyone has heard of antimatter. It has long played a role in science fiction. You can imagine Dr. McCoy in Star Trek probing his patients with antimatter beams, perhaps. Well, you might be surprised to know that antimatter is already routinely used in this way, probably in your local hospital. First, I will say a little about what antimatter is and how it was discovered. Paul Dirac was an English theoretical physicist, famous for his strictly logical approach to the world. Dirac was renowned for never making any utterance unless it was strictly necessary. The early decades of the 20th century saw two great revolutions in physics, relativity and quantum mechanics. Dirac took the first step towards uniting the two great theories in 1928 when he devised a wave equation, now known as the Dirac equation, to account for how an electron behaves even when travelling at close to the speed of light. Dirac soon realised his equation had some very curious features. It only seemed to work consistently if the electron had a mirror image counterpart, a particle with the same mass as an electron, but opposite electric charge. So whereas the electron has a negative electric charge, this mirror particle would have a positive electric charge. In 1931, Dirac suggested that we might refer to this hypothetical particle as an anti-electron. This was in the very early days of particle physics, when the only known fundamental particles were electrons, protons and photons, the fundamental constituents of light. So the prediction of a new type of particle was a really big deal. Amazingly, Dirac was proved to be correct just the following year. The American physicist Carl Anderson was studying particles created when high-energy cosmic rays from deep space collide with atoms in the Earth's atmosphere. Anderson spotted particles that looked like electrons, but in the magnetic field of his cloud chamber they spiralled in the opposite direction, so they had to be positively charged. When Anderson published his results, the journal editor suggested the new particles should be named positrons, short for positive electrons. And this is the name by which they are still known. They are Dirac's anti-electrons. Dirac's reasoning applies to other matter particles as well. So, for each type of matter particle, there is a corresponding antimatter particle. Their existence is now firmly established. We have antiprotons, antineutrons, antiquarks, antimuons, antineutrinos and so on. Dirac's prediction that the electron has an antiparticle, the positron, is one of the most incredible predictions in the history of physics. From the abstract structure of an equation that he had invented, Dirac intuited the existence of a whole new type of matter, antimatter. One of the key features of antimatter is that when a particle meets its antiparticle, they mutually annihilate. It is believed that in the very early universe, matter and antimatter formed in almost equal quantities. Almost all of the particles met up with their antiparticle counterparts and disappeared in a blast of radiation. Fortunately, there was a small surplus of matter particles, and these leftover particles eventually gave rise to all the planets, stars and galaxies of the visible universe. The reason for this small surplus of matter over antimatter is still not fully understood, but without it we would not be here. But what use is antimatter, you might ask? Well, if we want to visit the stars, antimatter propulsion could be the only feasible way of getting there and the possibility of such propulsion systems has been considered by NASA. A space vehicle whose thrust was generated through the mutual annihilation of protons and antiprotons might achieve 40% of the speed of light. There are, however, a few challenges that remain to be overcome, the biggest being the supply of antiprotons. Particle physics laboratories such as CERN and Fermilab routinely create antiprotons in their experiments. But so far, the total production could be measured in nanograms, which would be about enough to boil a kettle. 
Nonetheless, this hasn't stopped the space artists from dreaming. Back in the real world, there is an important medical imaging technology that makes very good use of antimatter. It is known as PET, which stands for Positron Emission Tomography. Prior to a PET scan, a radioactive positron emitting tracer is injected into a patient and the way in which it is sent to the appropriate part of the body is really ingenious. The radioactive isotope that is most often used is fluorine 18. The nucleus of an atom of fluorine 18 is composed of 9 protons and 9 neutrons. It undergoes radioactive decay in a process called positive beta decay in which one of its protons transforms into a neutron with the emission of a positron and a neutrino. This converts the nucleus into a stable oxygen-18 nucleus composed of 8 protons and 10 neutrons. The neutrino disappears off into space, but the positron proves to be very useful. The positron almost immediately meets an electron and they mutually annihilate. The released energy escapes in the form of two gamma ray photons that depart in opposite directions. Gamma rays are essentially high energy X-rays. They are electromagnetic radiation, just like visible light, but with a much shorter wavelength and carrying far more energy. So how is the fluorine 18 delivered to the target area of the patient's body? The key is to combine the fluorine 18 atoms with an appropriate chemical compound and the most widely used delivery compound is known as fluorodeoxyglucose or FDG which simply means that one of the oxygen atoms in a glucose molecule is replaced with a fluorine atom and for a PET scan this fluorine atom must be the radioactive fluorine 18 rather than the stable fluorine 19. As FDG is so similar to ordinary glucose, it is transported around the body to organs that consume large amounts of energy, such as the brain and kidneys, and also to cancerous cells which have abnormally high levels of glucose consumption. The body cannot metabolise FDG, so once it has been transported to the cells that require a good glucose supply, it remains there until the fluorine 18 atom undergoes radioactive decay. When this happens, the fluorine atom becomes an oxygen 18 atom and the FDG is transformed into a molecule of glucose that can now be metabolised as normal. This method of delivery is great because it avoids leaving any strange chemicals lurking in the body. About an hour after being injected with the FDG solution, the patient lies within a scanner for about 30 minutes. The scanner detects the pairs of gamma rays emitted in the electron-positron annihilations and gradually builds up a picture of the inside of the patient's body. The gamma rays reveal the sites within the body where glucose is being consumed. It is like having an x-ray but with the gamma rays arising from within the body. PET scans are complementary to other types of medical scan such as CAT scans which reveal structural or anatomical information about the body and its tissues. PET scans reveal functional information. They provide information about the consumption of glucose in various parts of the body. Because cancer cells consume more glucose than normal tissue, they show up as bright spots in a PET scan. So it is possible to locate very small tumours before they would show up with other types of scan. PET scans can also reveal brain abnormalities such as Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. What about the risks? The half-life of fluorine 18 is 110 minutes, which is long enough to perform the imaging, but not too long. Within a few hours, the radioactive tracer has completely disappeared from the patient's body. The radiation dose received by the patient is equivalent to two to three years of normal background radiation or about what you would receive due to cosmic rays on 25 long distance flights. The benefits of the scan far outweigh the low risk due to this radiation dose. We've got some great new videos about astrophysics and nuclear physics in the pipeline. So don't forget to click the subscribe button and ring the bell and then you'll receive notification as soon as we've got a new video online. Thank you for watching. I'm Nicholas Mee. May the force be with you.